नमस्ते ए ट्रिब्यूट टू श्योर बिंदो ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ फोर्थ अप्रैल वी नो दैट श्योर बिंदो केम टू पाण्डिचेरी ऑन द फोर्थ ऑफ अप्रैल 1910 एट द बिहेस्ट ऑफ एन इनर कमांड फ्रॉम कोलकाता टू चंदनगर एंड चंदनगर टू पाण्डिचेरी सो in the shirbindu circles this event is commemorated remembered mother spoke about this uh, event as uh, signifying the new year of pondicherry because uh, when we look at uh, what pondicherry was before shirbindu's coming it was regarded as a dead city city of ghouls even um, nolnida says that uh, it is it was like a shamshan bhumi because after 6 pm one could not come out it was full of you know all kinds of people of course they were the uh, those who loved the country and they were the french people who uh, governed through a laissez faire affair as if you know it's okay they turned a blind eye their job was basically to collect their own booty so it is in a way a new year of pondicherry but uh, that apart uh, these events and circumstances in which they he came when we look at them they are a great inspiration in fact shobindu's life is a great inspiration so when we just take a look before coming to pondicherry shobindu had touched both this worldly glory and the spiritual glory both of them so he was missing out on neither of them in terms of worldly glory we all know that uh, he was regarded by the british as the most dangerous man in india his writings were deeply and widely appreciated including as we know tagore had spoken about um, in such glorious terms about shorbindo and he had a wide uh, acclaim uh, name and fame so much so that wherever he went people would gather and there would be pin drop silence people describe those moments when shubindu has traveled and he spoke and uh, there was so much adulation some of them would regard him as avatar actually uh, he was the rising not just the rising star the star in the firmament of indian freedom struggle he also had other kinds of worldly glory in terms of his accomplishment he is uh, not another sadhu baba to say the least he is somebody who has not only studied in cambridge but he has cleared the ics his poetry is already beginning to be recognized his first poem his um, his play harmony of virtues and even great names in english literature poetry they saw in his poetry the seed of a beautiful poet who will emerge very powerful poet <clears throat> so in terms of worldly glories and then being almost the man on whom the maharaja of gaikwad depended so closely and then the professorship of english and french in uh, baroda college and also as an acting principal for some time so he had everything that a worldly man would want covet at that point of time he also had all that a spiritual person would want which is amazing he had the experience of nirvana he had the experience of free flow of poetry doing pranayam he had the experience of the vacant infinite the advaitic realization he had uh, the opening of the subtle vision through which he could see many forms and figures and above all to top it all he had the rarest of rare experience realization of vasudevam sarvamiti which the gita itself describes that samahatma ch durlabha it's a rarest of rare who can see the divine immanent in all things and this was not just a feeling in the bar in the prison bar in the book in the bowl in the jailers in human beings in the cow in the cow shed in the ant in the tree in the wall in the judge in the lawyer who is pleading on his behalf and the lawyer who is pleading against him in every one he saw vasudeva and again the beauty of this experience these experiences for a moment we should pause and understand 
that none of Shurabindo's experiences, spiritual experiences, were in a state of withdrawing from the world. In fact, he writes in one of the letters, Since the time I landed on the soil of India, all my experiences have been this worldly as well as otherworldly at the same time. And most of them have come very spontaneously. As soon as he lands up in Apollo Bandar, he has the experience of a deep calm descending upon him. And he is standing on the uh, rooftop in Kolkata. He is bit by a scorpion and he experiences how this pain can be transmuted into delight. He suddenly sees the whole um, city float like a cinema and vanish before his eyes. He stands in front of the image of Kali Ma and sees in her the living embodiment of the world mother. Or he goes right through the flight of stairs in Saras Bagh in the Parvati temple and suddenly he has the vision of the uh, world mother. In India, he sees Mother Durga manifesting herself. So, all his experiences uh, happen while he is in worldly life. This is something very amazing and that's why the mother says something very interesting and important. What Sri came to tell us? And she says, Sri came to tell us that one need not leave this life to find God. One need not leave this world to enter into relation with the Divine. And if we do not, are not able to do so, if we are not able to find Him, it is because we do not take the care to discover. Not exact word, but something like that. What He came to tell us, in the thick of the battle, in the midst of not just uh, worldly life, He was married and He is a Brahmachari. He confesses that in one of His casual statements. He is uh, supposed to be a suited, booted, English man who has studied in Cambridge and he sleeps on the floor, wears a dhoti. He's a master in English and a master in Sanskrit. Master, of course, in French and many other languages. So, such an accomplished person with all that this worldly human being could seek, want, desire, covet. And all the spiritual wealth and spiritual experiences and realization that a seeker after spiritual life could ever get or want or hope for, all that comes into him. So naturally, so spontaneously. So much so that at one of the places he says that, well, what can I do if Nirvana walked into me without as much as saying, <laughs> hello, I, am, I want to come in. So, all this, of course, we understand that there is a whole past preparation, all that is there. But having done all this, the, what, what uh, touches me personally most and especially this uh, departure from Kolkata to Chandanagar to Pondicherry is, what a complete surrender and submission that Sri has towards the Divine. He is the divine himself, but as we know that the avatar has to show the way. Avatar doesn't come as a thaumatized miracle doer. He doesn't come beating drum that I am God, I am God. He has to show the human beings. So much so that in one of those uh, beautiful incidents, Sister Nivedita tells him that, you know, she has heard news about uh, British who have uh, want to now arrest him. Already there was a sedition charge earlier, which was dropped off. And then this was, I think, the second one. Then there was a third one also later on. <clears throat> second one was Alipur Jail. And uh, she says, better that you go away. And he says, he pauses for a moment and then he says, who else but you would know better that when someone has surrendered to the Divine Mother, uh, he cannot leave without the orders from the Divine Mother. So I have given myself to her. And I cannot leave based on just worldly considerations. And sure enough, the order comes, the command comes <laughs> because he has put such a condition and he leaves, he goes. At one command, at the literally what is called as the drop of a hat, he vanishes. Without questioning, without asking anything, such a surrender is so rare, rarest of rare. No mental calculations come in. And then something else which is even more inspiring. And that inspiring is, thing is about his renunciation. Shubindu lived in world, apparently 
we understand by renunciation, renouncing things outwardly. He is a married person. He is working in the Maharaja of Baroda's estate, earning a very good salary. And that salary, which was around 750 rupees a month, he leaves it just like that to join the Calcutta National College, where he is hardly getting any amount and that too slowly dwindles off and stops. No calculations again, absolutely uncalculating. That, In fact, he writes that letter to his wife, Nilani Devi, that up till now I have lived like a thief. That letter is so touching that uh, I earn so much and I give only two annas to God and keep 14 annas to myself. Who could write like that? He was known as Tyagarajan in his circles. So this idea that a sannyasi is a Tyagi, which Sri Krishna has corrected in the Gita, Shobindu is a living embodiment of the Gita. A Jivan Mukta who is living like a complete renunciate but making no fuss, no pretensions about being renunciate. He is not moving around in any Gerva Vastra or this uh, colored dress or that colored dress, chanting Sanskrit slokas, taking lectures on the Gita or nothing he does. He is participating in the freedom struggle. He is writing letters to his wife, very touching letters. To everybody, he is uh, writing speeches for the Maharaj of Baroda. He is counselling, advising people on the various things. Very few people know the Anushilan Samiti, which ultimately blossomed into RSS. It, its seed was sown by Sri Of course, it has grown in a different way altogether. So, that's Anushilan Samiti with the help of Bhagajatin and few others. And there is a very interesting reminiscence, I think it's of Sudhir Sarkar, of time may be forgetting, that they came to Sri for some counsel. So, he would work from behind the scene. And Sri says, it was the British government that uh, pulled the <laughs> curtain away. <laughs> and uh, when he goes uh, and wants to meet Sri so Nalida says that, uh, uh, Aurobindo Babu is resting for a while. So he said, I'll wait. And he says, when he comes down, in wherever he was staying, as he comes down and he sees him, he is completely amazed that who is he? He has gone to meet a revolutionary who is going to give uh, some adesh, uh, some, some counsel. How does he give a counsel? He says, he asked him something. Shabindo paused for some time. And then he just said, turn back and went away. <laughs> There's no formality, no discussions, no debates. And one classic picture that is one of my favorites is Shurabindu in the Surat Congress, where he is the one who gave the order to break the Congress. If you see that photograph, you see Tilak is standing and pointing, one can see that fire. You see other people, Surinath Banerjee is sitting by the side and others. And Shurabindu is sitting as if, in the midst of this crowd, there is that intense zone of silence. You can't look at anybody after looking at him. So, with all this at his hand, he just renounced because the Lord wants him to be elsewhere. Many people misunderstood him. Later on, Shivinda writes in his letter that I left because already, apart from the Adesh, whatever was required for India to gain independence, all that was already established. All the lines along which the freedom is going to come, he had done that. He had awakened the soul of India. And then he knew that people are not yet ready for what he wants them to be. And therefore, time has, will come in the course of time. The ball has been set rolling. And then he withdraws and he withdraws for a greater work. Where does he withdraw? His renunciation is not that from world he goes to Himalaya. He goes to another place, <laughs> Pondicherry of all the places. He could have renounced and gone to Himalayas, vanished. But he goes all the way to Pondicherry, which as we know, apart from being a French city, was a city which was known as a dangerous place after a certain period of time. And there also he was engaged with different groups, people who came to meet him. But what he did there was because he plunged into a deep, intense sadhana, not only for redeeming a 
one human being or a few human being or some people who had gathered, who would gathered around him, but for the whole earth. And personally, to me, this aspect of Shurabindo is the most lovable one. So people who approach Shurabindo with the mind. They say, oh my God, this is so difficult and this, okay, it is difficult. When somebody asked the mother, Mother, when I read Shobindo, I feel so beautiful, so uplifted. And I wonder why is it that people are not reading these uh, wonderful jewels and gems. I wish they could read. And this is the impression that many of us feel in the beginning. Why are they not reading? Here is, you know, Amrit, Nectar. So the mother's reply is, uh, and then the disciple writes that maybe is it because uh, I am my thinking is tainted by my devotion to Shurabindo, and the mother writes that um, who can understand Shurabindo? He is as vast as the universe, and his teaching is infinite. The only thing that we, the only way to understand him a little is by to come a little close to him through love. And through serving, serving him and his work, to take up his work in the in an unconditional way. I'll read out the exact thing because it's very powerful. So when the mother asked, mother was asked this, she gave a very powerful message. She says, "Who can understand Shirvindo? He is as vast as the universe, and his teaching is infinite. What is infinite about teaching?" This when I had read, I used to ponder what is infinite about teaching, because you feel teaching is a finite thing, but then like a door opens, and you see through it. So teaching is infinite because it takes you to the infinite. The teaching is infinite because you cannot reduce it to any fixed dogma, belief, ideology. It is infinite. So that is the beauty of this teaching. This teaching is not a religious teaching. It's not a doctrine. It's not a um, you know system of philosophy. So this teaching is so vast that if you really enter into it, your mind and heart, everything begins to enter into the infinite because this teaching is born from the infinite realm of the infinite, if you want to call it. Though it would be a paradox because infinite is infinite. So this teaching, his teaching, is infinite. The only way to come a little close to him is to love him sincerely and give oneself unreservedly to his work. To love him sincerely. And actually, I often suggest people who say that Shabindu is so difficult. Don't uh, worry about that. Read still. But more importantly, read something of Shabindu's life. So when you read Shabindu's life, it is so beautiful. Then you see his heart of compassion and love. Why would someone who has all the glories in the world at the age of what? 72, born 1910. Okay? <laughs> Not even properly midlife. He's 38 years old. Why would a 38 year young person who has already achieved the highest that one can imagine in worldly as well as spiritual, material and spiritual fields, would leave everything and walk and engage in a yet greater tapasya. And that is where we see that heart of compassion. He did all this because he wanted that the glory that he was experiencing, that should be tasted by all. Because he saw the condition of life in which humanity is laboring upon earth. Otherwise, before Sri was coming, what were the options? One option was, this world is as it is, a dog's crooked tail, you cannot do much about it. Either you baptize with it, or else, for whatever reason, you accept it as a preparation for a post-mortem salvation, or a post-mortem mukti, or mukti even, sadeh mukti or Videya Mukti, whichever way you want to put it. So these were the options, that this world is what it is. If you feel the urge to change it, it's a prison, but you, instead of it being a third class prison, you can make it a first class prison. So you can improve the outer conditions, you can have better clothing, better food, better system of governance, 
uh, and make human life a little more comfortable within its limits and boundaries. Other option was if you believe that, well, ultimately these are the limits. So you can take recourse to Bhaj Govindam, Bhaj Govindam, Shivoham, Shivoham and make a transit. Moksha, Nirvana. But both sound so incomplete. Again, this worldly or otherworldly, where you leave this world as it is. And it makes actually a mockery of God himself, of creator. Because if really this is the whole thing, end is going to be one or a few people's exit into nirvana, then what kind of creation this is? So first time, people often say this world is a hell. Well, yes, Shurabindu is the answer. This is a very interesting line passage in Savitri where Rashapati is contemplating and he hears a voice. And that voice tells him that this is the condition of man. That he climbs too little. He cannot, you know. Uh, the hearts that yearn to love are given just one brief hour. His tail half told falters the heavenly bard. The gods are still too few in human forms, mortal forms. And then after that Akashwani, uh, Savitri is coming from the other side after her quest is over. And then Shubindu writes, Then like a shining answer from the gods came Savitri. <laughs> so, so mankind, it is ages of aspiration and tapasya of mankind. Ultimately, man descended here unhappy and sublime. This is our paradox. So he is the answer to this question. Can this earth change? Can human beings change? Can we live here freely, largely, normally and divinely? That's how the mother says that what was Sri Krishna's mission? She says, Sri Krishna came to teach mankind how to live normally and freely and divinely. Otherwise, invariably you have this, oh, no, no, you have to withdraw from life. So this is the quest that every every thinking creature has it but since he has there is no answer he accepts whatever is there many people stop believing in god which is understandable because if this is the world that the creator has made <laughs> what would be that creator who has made this hellish nightmare and tells us in the end to just make a transit so shurabindu answers this quest of man it is for man that he is doing the tapasya he had no reason, no... Personally, he needed nothing. Neither any worldly gain nor other worldly gain. He had everything. And he could have even finished by writing all that is, he had discovered, given a path of yoga to mankind. Okay, this is my discovery. You can be a Jeevan Mukt, which itself is a high state. And he could have reiterated the Gita and given to man a new version of the Gita. Because through the Gita, you can be a Jeevan Mukt, which he had already realized. So what is the need of giving something else? Because even the Jeevan Mukt Avastha of the Gita is not enough. You will have few Jeevan Muktas here and there. But nature will still be bound, limited by the three Gunas. Your soul can be Trigunatit, but nature is still what it is. And as long as nature is what it is, you cannot have a divine life. You cannot live truly as children of God. Or you will live as children of God who have no rights, no, no, no power, no knowledge that God has. But you are inwardly free. So that he didn't want. As he says, I didn't want to give my uh, sanction to the old fiasco or put the old wine in a new bottle. He didn't want to repackage. Nowadays there is a lot of trend of repackaging Vedanta, repackaging the Gita, repackaging all of these other things into... But he didn't want to repackage. He wanted to bring something new which can be a permanent cure. Permanent answer, permanent solution, permanent remedy to the ills that plague mankind. And that when you see the trail of his journey after 1910, it is amazing. All this tapasya and what conditions. On one side the British government sword is still dangling over him. Lures, money, have an ashram in... Algeria, at the same time the spy is still trying to find some way to catch him and deport him to the British territory. All kinds of things. Very little money is available. 
and yet he is engaged in all this. He could have given the yoga, written nice stuff, maybe living in Pondicherry, given a lot of talks to people gathered around him and that would have been the beautiful, as they call, ending. <laughs> but Sri did not come to end things. He came to create a new beginning, a new and unprecedented beginning. And for that, he was engaged in bringing a new yoga for earth and man through which mankind will cross ultimately the borders of ignorance, not an individual or a few devotees or disciples, but mankind as a whole and create a new race. And this new race, a superhumanity of tomorrow or the divine being of tomorrow, call it by whatever name, that's not so important, the supramental being, it will reset the balance of earth which has been destroyed by man, the mental being. So what man has done, lot of damage. We don't, we don't need to really uh, discuss that. And he continues to do that. Man has not only destroyed the outer nature, material nature. That would be something because you can say, you cut trees, you can plant trees. In the course of developing certain things, you have to pay a certain price. Man has destroyed or tried to destroy divine nature which of all things is not only most dangerous, it's an impossible thing. So when Ravana was destroying Yajnavedis, what was he doing? It was not just few rishis or something. He didn't want that there should be any god except his kind, the Asura should rule this earth. And we see even today, I was talking about this uh, ideologies which try to destroy all hope of greatness nobility etc in man. So when people mock at, you know, there have been universities, even Pondicherry University recently, they had a mock uh, mockery of Ramayana or in JNU when they mocked uh, Durga. It's not about religion, they don't understand. What is Durga stands for? Durga stands for the strong, beautiful woman, it's glorious womanhood. When you do this, you are basically destroying the feminine potential and power. Taking away this hope from mankind. At least my problem of these people is that it's not about religion, this religion or that religion. What does Durga stand for? What does Rama stand for? Rama stands for the glorious manhood of Aryavarta, where strength, wisdom, love, charity, compassion, all of them come together in a single human being. He's a friend to the friend. He cares for everybody from the animal to the bird to the even the Rakshasa and Asura when they come to him and surrender and you you destroy that ideal what do you replace it with you replace it with all that is low and ugly and vulgar this is the problem problem is not it should not be seen only through the religious lens there are a lot of people who may not believe that's okay but we should know what it stands for so Sri restores all that this is what is called uh, restoring the dharma. That's how it is put. Yadaya dahi dharma se glani bhavati bharata abhyutthanam dharma se tadatman srijamayam. So he restores the lost balance which man has done by his so called mind of which he is so arrogantly proud of. Of course, there have been yogis who have been in their own way doing it, but the balance of life itself, it's not just few yogis finding the way. They don't restore the balance of life. They find a way through which the soul can escape. Balance of life means every field of life, the balance should be reset. Reset, reset. There should be, imagine a program through which you say, reset the balance. Material nature, balance is reset. Emotional imbalances, the balance is reset. Intellectual lopsided thinking, perverted thinking, all this is reset. Life, Lost in the tracts and mazes of all kinds of pursuits. Reset. So that life rises loftier, higher, mightier towards vast horizons. Body. Such a slave to disease, death, imperfection, incapacity. Up till animal life, it's so interesting. The body is able to regenerate itself. See how many kinds of balances we have upset. Animal body, largely, not always, perhaps... They are coming in contact with human beings. I think they have been contaminated with this disease called as <laughs> lowering of their 
uh, responses because it happens intermingling. I don't know how people are in the wild, animals are in the wild, but by and large, you don't hear that they died of uh, so many diseases. They can become carriers. Anyways, it's a very rare event. But suddenly with the coming of man, up till a point it's still okay. But as mankind advances along the lines of mind, all kinds of balances are lost. Our own balance of health is lost. And then we try to compensate it with hospitals, doctors and medicines, which anyways, that's the only thing we have at this point of time. So he resets the balance. And therefore we see at every level, Sri the works, his teachings are truly connecting every finite activity of man to the infinite. Whether it be in the field of health, in education, in psychology, in science, whole science of consciousness, poetry, literature, everyday life, sleeping, eating, marriage, children, call it whatever, human relationship, every field he resets the balance. Not just to live as mental beings centered around our little self, but as divine beings, how to live. In other words, what does Shabindu teach us? How to live freely, largely, normally, and divinely. We don't have to do anything extraordinary. Change our attire or put a, you know, Rudraksh Mala and, you know, take something here. We don't have to do that. Of course, there is something we have to do, <laughs> which is the most difficult. Carrying a Mala is easy, but being sincere is far more difficult. That's why the mother says, sincerity to Sri Aurobindo, sincerely. So who would not love Sri Aurobindo? If you once you see what he has been doing, his wo renoun renouncing worldly life and going to the Himalaya and then teaching things which are disconnected from real life as it is. All the various pujas, japas, homas and all that. They are nice things in our ignorance. They are ways of forming connection with something which is beyond this world and therefore they are beautiful things. At least some kind of contact. But to bring that glory here, embody it here in everyday life, so that our whole life becomes a song of the soul, a heaving of life toward the infinite, a worship of the unseen beloved through form and the formless in various ways. So this is what his teaching brings to us and the way and the path and the help, all that is there. And then you see that this renunciation and with all that power and glory, it's not a joke. At 38, all that Sri had realized and the power that he had gathered in himself. And yet when you see the perfect gentle manliness, never a harsh word, never. Either in his verbal speech, at one place Sri says, anger has always been foreign to me. And once it is described that in the Halipur jail when someone pushed him, Shabindu just looked at him. He says only two occasions. He just looked at him. And the jailer ran away. Oh, he has gone mad. He has gone mad. What are these eyes? I can't. He couldn't bear it. And the another time was when somebody was shouting something against the mother. And Shabindu comes on the threshold of the room and simply said, Who is that? And there was a pin drop silence. And then when he came to know that the, the soup ceremony people are saying that it is unhygienic, he asked mother to stop it. And he said, under his breath, brutes, brutes, under his breath. Never a harsh word, never an unkind word. What a forgiveness. Oh, death for a few stones. Somebody who is trying to harm him. But the same one have, has fought and demolished the British Empire. Actually, it is because of his all that he had put into it. He capable capacity to destroy a British Empire. And that process continues. And that ability to turn the tide of the Second World War. What a power. And with all that, when he is so gentlemanly, I suppose this letter has to be posted. 
Everybody wants to take it, but he is like that. Everybody's uh, feelings he would care for. All could approach him. That's how he wrote that. Okay, people say he was not accessible for darshan. Yes, he didn't need. You don't need that. He said regarding darshan, if I gave darshan more often, people will not be able to assimilate it. So that was because he was engaged in a permanent remedy. But he was accessible through letters. Look at the gentle manliness. Uh, I mean, I can say, I have seen people, if you ask the same thing, even parent and child. When parents grow old and ask their child, same question and again and again, sometimes they become demented and ask. Children get so annoyed and angry. People are asking Shurabindo, same question with a little twist here, little twist there. Same person, mind you. And he's writing reams after reams of answers. Thanks to them, of course, today we have such wealth. But he's not, oh, I have told you, read my letter. Didn't you read? Why don't you read all my volumes? Why are you asking me again and again? Don't you know how important work I am engaged in? Only once he says this. What does he say? He says, I am not able to get time for my main work. Once he said, very passingly. What was his main work? Of course, the supramental manifestation. And in terms of writing, Savitri. He says, it's my most important work. And so when Savitri is over, he says, ah, it is finished. And Niruddha says, but book of death we have to revise. And he says, that we'll see later. It's like as if it is not important. So that kind of gentle manliness that he's not refusing anyone. No, 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 you don't. And people would complain after two days if the reply has not come. Sir, I thought that Sunday you will have time to reply. For sure, there was no Sunday. <laughs> no Sunday. And somebody is a temerity, right? We thought on Sunday you will have the time to reply. And Shurabindo, without his usual gentle maldiness, he simply says, if you were to see the burden of correspondence in which my nose is buried, even the heart of a heart, this stone-like disciple like you, would melt. He says, if you only saw the correspondence and the kind of work I am engaged in, you would not doubt about the avatar would. On the typewriter sitting and writing, sometimes I feel so silly. Some people say, you know, somebody needs a secretary or somebody to help. I say, Our Lord has said, such a high yardstick. <laughs> He never asked for anybody. It's only after the fracture of the leg that people came. And what kind of service? And basically it was the mother who looked after him. That's a different story altogether. Amazing story. So when we look at Shurabindu and his gentle manliness and cheerfulness, something which is so fascinating, even in the thick of things, <laughs> When his leg after the fracture and <laughs> he is supposed to maintain a certain posture and suddenly when he comes to know, mother is coming, oh, mother is coming. So he, they are all sitting <laughs> nicely as if like, uh, you know, in a classroom, <laughs> children are <laughs> sitting and then when the doctor comes and he asks him questions and the way he replies so sweetly, hanging the legs, asking them, okay, tell me what exercise I have to do. Like a baby, that cheerfulness all through you see in Shurabindo. There are only three occasions, or rather two, when he looked a little grave. One is, otherwise carrying the burden on his shoulders of humanity, tapasya. We have the tapasya people and they get angry when they are disturbed. In the middle of his tapasya, with that intense tapasya, and Two occasions. One was when, before 1926, when mother was taking everybody's burden onto herself. She had plunged into this hell of darkness. That why should I ask my children to do any tapasya? I'll do it for all. She was identifying with all the darkness. And as a result, she felt very sick. And 
she was on what can be called as outwardly as a deathbed. And knowing the mother, she'll never ask anything for herself. Everything she asked only for the Lord as, as you will and for her children. And that is the time when Sri asked nobody to see the mother for those few days. And that's the time when people saw Sri a little grave. And one can understand what it meant. And the second time was when uh, 15th August, there was this little riot going on and Mula Shankar, who used to give massage to Sri leg, and he had gone to, um, it was a foolish thing to do, to start with. He had gone to the general hospital, there was some, to, just to, uh, out of curiosity, what is happening, what is happening, or that side, outside. She was not supposed to do, nobody was supposed to do. And in that melee, he was stabbed. A little riot broke out and he was stabbed and he died. So people say that again they saw Sri grave. What he must be doing, what kind of karmas, of what one person or humanity, we don't know. And the third time when it was not so much grave, as they felt something amiss, that is just before his departure. But even then, Niroda says, 2nd December they all have gone, or 24th November, they all had darshan. Nobody could make out that there is anything brewing up. Because he was always absorbing poison inside and giving everybody amrit. That's how Sri is. And who won't love him? You don't need to, I mean, read him because it's the, it's the letter of a lover and beloved. Not just beloved, lover. The master of man, that's how it describes Krishna, which applies to him. The master of man and his infinite lover. And then the supreme sacrifice. And people have the temerity to say, oh, why he died and he died. Such words they use. And the mother says, supreme strategic sacrifice to hasten the collective realization because earth and man was not receptive. Who would not love Sri Aurobindo? At least that's the only thing that we can do, however imperfectly, however, in whatever limited way, to love is a big word. We don't know even to love man. Forget about loving the divine. But at least in, to some extent. So when we read Sri when we see his life, we see a vast source of love in his heart. There is a poem, Seer Deep Hearted, which is like an autobiographical poem. Seer Deep Hearted, Divine King of Secrecies. All the secrets he knows. Vast in thy soul, occult fountain of love. Divine King of Secrecies, occult fountain of love. Vast in thy soul was a tide washing the coasts of heaven. White star scripts of the gods born from the thoughts broke burning and bare crossing the human night. White star scripts of the gods born from the presses of light. Because we are we don't have are not privy to God's plan and what, what's brewing up. He goes there, brings it and gives to man. Page by page to the dim children of earth were given. That is sure window and so much more. Words cannot describe, but just let me close with an incidence recounted by the mother. What kind of power Sri embodies? And you see constantly in 71 when the disciple asks, where is Sri and what is he doing? He says, oh, he is like a golden force pressing upon earth. His power has increased so much more after his physical withdrawal. He says earlier, people used to complain that he has not responded, though I know he responded. Sometimes it was by letters, sometimes silently. But now, nothing. You just go to the samadhi and you say, just like you are approaching me, she tells the disciple. You go to the samadhi and tell him, he hears, now he is hearing everybody simultaneously. That is the wish rupa of Sri Krishna. He doesn't need to first pay attention here. Yes. So that's why because released on the body, the power is 
knows no bounds. In the body you are limited. You can write letter to one person. <laughs> While in your inner consciousness you are working upon the whole world. But here and with the supramental action you can work upon many simultaneously. So she recounts two very interesting incidents with which we will stop. Not long ago M's sister died. Psychologically she was in a terrible state. She had no faith. Well, on that day, just when I came to know that she was passing away, I remember being upstairs in the bathroom communicating with Sri Aurobindo, having a sort of conversation with him. This is, Mother is recounting this in 60s and this incidence in 51, so after Sri Aurobindo's physical patrol. And I asked him, what happens to such people when they die here at the ashram. Look, he replied. Mother describes this actually another place very interesting. He just goes, carries her and puts it at mother's feet. And then there is something interesting she says. Look, he replied and I saw her passing away and on her forehead I saw Shurbindo symbol in a solid golden light. Not very luminous, but very concrete, very beautiful description. There it was. And with the presence of this sign, the psychological state no longer mattered. Nothing touched her. She had no faith. A terrible state. Anger prone, we all know that. Who would start, I want to commit suicide, that kind of state. And she departed tranquilly. Then Sri Aurobindo told me, All who have lived at the ashram and who die there have automatically the same protection, whatever their inner state. <laughs> who can say this? <laughs> See, we think Kashi is a myth. Champak Lalji says this, he says, and mother spoke about Banaras as a spiritually charged place. But we have this tendency, you know, are these are stories. What will you say to this story? And the mother says, I can't say I was surprised, but I admired the mighty power by which the simple fact of having been here. You may have done sadhana, not done sadhana, all that is and died here was sufficient to help you to the utmost in that transition. They don't go to death, they go to Sri She describes later on that what she is doing in subtle physical with Sri <laughs> What work she is doing. We get a work also there. And then she describes another case. Take ND. For example, a man who lived his whole life with the idea of serving Sri that's his sadhana. I want to serve Sri Aurobindo. I want to serve Sri Aurobindo. He died clasping my photo to his breast. This was a consecrated man, very conscious, with an unfailing dedication and all the parts of his being well organized around the psyche. By the very fact you want to serve, your thoughts will come, your heart will come, your life energy, your body, everything will come. And who wants to serve? It's always the psychic being which has this urge. The day he was going to leave his body, little M was meditating next to the Samadhi. When suddenly she had a vision. She saw all the flowers of the tree next to the Samadhi. Those yellow flowers I have called service. Gathering themselves together to form a big bouquet. And rising, rising, straight up. And in her vision, these flowers were linked with the image of Andy. She ran quickly to their house and he was dead. I only knew about this vision later. But on my side, when he left, I saw his whole being gathered together, well united, thoroughly homogeneous, in a great aspiration. And rising, rising without dispersing, without deviating, straight up to the frontier of what Sri has called the higher hemisphere, 
देयर वेयर शुर बिंदो इन इज सुपरामेंटल एक्शन प्रिसाइड्स ओवर अर्थ एंड ही मेल्टेड इन टू दैट लाइट कैन यू इमेजिन ए मोर परम गति and one last very interesting thing shubindu's world in the subtle physical have i told you is the same conversation which continues have i told you about the experience i had that day i suddenly found myself in shubindu's home in the subtle physical well it's as if i took a step and entered a far more concrete world than the physical mark the words far more concrete world than the physical it changes our understanding mother once said that shobindo is constantly with us in the subtle physical and we can see him if we have this subtle vision and if he chooses to manifest himself now why she uses the word more concrete that also she describes more concrete because things contain more truth so our whole idea of concrete and subtle changes i spent a good while there with shurbindo and then when it was over i took another step and i found myself back here slightly dumbfounded it took me quite some time to regain my bearings here because it was this world that seemed unreal to me not the other but it's simply that you take a step and you enter another room and when you live in your soul there is a continuity because the soul remembers it keeps the whole memory meaning thereby many of us go but we don't remember because that continue we have gaps in consciousness so when we come across we forget sometimes of course you can remember it remembers all occurrences even outer occurrences all the outer movements it has been associated with so it's a continuous uninterrupted movement here and there from one room to another from one house to another from one life to another so shivinder has literally created not only this here pondicherry that power mighty power with which whoever lives regardless of their state of consciousness whoever lives at the ashram and you know even without faith without anything straight away is taken up by him death cannot come it cannot touch and he has also created what i would call as a shurbindo dham right next to this physical world where the new creation is being shaped formed so that when mankind here by and large is ready it has to just precipitate itself what is called in computer languages upgrading or downloading the software or it's getting ready and mother speaks about it the contents of the certificate everything is getting ready because it's far more easier there to do it and then when things are ready here it will just precipitate itself and we'll see as she has described it will happen magically and beauty conquer the resisting world because once man is ready to receive there are things awaiting and it precipitates itself to such a shurbindo what can one say no salutation is no gratitude can ever be enough all that i can say is love shurbindo love the mother and if we can do it in all sincerity that's more than enough just taking his name is more than enough just a few lines shri aurobindo nami anando <laughs> shri aurobindo nami anando jogi rajo namo namo मीरा माता जगत द्राता मीरा माता जगत द्राता करुणा मोई नमो नमो जोगी राजो नमो नमो 
ಶ್ರೀಯೋರುಬಿಂದು ನಮಿಯನಂದು ಜೋಗೀರಾಜೋ ನಮೋ ನಮೋ ಮಾ